Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and even more special, this is part of our Schrodinger's Diary series, where Anthony Peake and other guests, and myself, try to get to the reality behind the reality, as well as understand the mysteries of consciousness. And uh, we will be discussing today Anthony Peake's new book, Opening the Doors of Perception, The Key to Cosmic Awareness. How are you doing today, Anthony? I'm doing terrifically well, Miguel, and it's great to be back in contact and chatting with one of my one of my Gnostic heroes from over there at the other side of the water. <laughs> Perhaps Gnostic villains. I don't know the same <laughs> thing these days, but no, it's uh, always an honor having you back and chatting with you. So let's talk about, well, let's talk about your wonderful book. It's a very ambitious uh, title, Opening the Doors of Perception, taking off Aldous Huxley and, of course, one of those Gnostic saints, William Blake. Tell us about the title and how it ties in with your thesis. Right, well, as you, as you know, and you and I have discussed this many, many times, the, the, the influence of William Blake, William Blake in terms of the idea of the na- true nature of reality. And I read uh, The Doors of Perception many, many years ago, uh, probably in the late 1970s, if not earlier. Um, and I've been fascinated by the way Huxley approached the idea of what exactly reality is, what exactly consciousness is, and the role of the brain in this. And I'd always wanted to revisit Huxley and write a book on it. And it just seemed to be the perfect um, sequel to my doors, uh, to my book, um, The Infinite Minefield, because I was leading up to my work on on DMT, ayahuasca, and, and various other areas. And it just seemed to make eminent good sense. And I approached Watkins, the publisher of um, the, the Infinite Minefield, and they were more than keen. And they said, no, we think it's an excellent idea. And we will back this book to the hilt. And to give them credit, they really have pushed this book really well. Um, and I started researching it and I found that I, I genuinely believe this is probably my best book. And I think it's because of the way in which the information was was already available to me. In other words, all my other books seem to be a preparation for this one. So I was able to write it without a great deal of direct research because the information was already there. So it was an absolute dream to write. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm really hoping that this will will sort of cause a reaction in the world. In fact, funnily enough, you'll be interested to know that um, Watkins is so delighted with the book, they've already bought from me the rights for the sequel. So already, we, you know, I'm I'm writing a book at the moment on J.B. Priestley, the, the English uh, playwright. And once I finish that in, in the end of um, November, I'll be starting writing what I'm provisionally calling Through the Doors of Perception, which maybe we can touch on a little bit later. Of course, of course. And yeah, it was a great read. I mean, I've been following your work for years and you bring it all together with some uh, wonderful new angles and new research. And I, again, as I mentioned, I've been following you for years and I've always been like, well, what what is Anthony Peake? And uh, 
I think Gary Lockman pretty much put a, a title because that's what he calls himself, and that's a, a, a scholar of consciousness. That's what I see you, Anthony. You're really trying to break open the idea of consciousness. And this ties in with Aldous Huxley because isn't basically consciousness or the reality we are is there's there's a valve to a greater world, and you're trying to unlock how to manage this valve. Absolutely. The idea that the brain acts as an attenuator. The brain is something that excludes information from what, what we can generally know as neurotypicals. They are individuals who, whose, whose brain functions in the way it should. And of course, the reason why the brain works this way is perfectly reasonable, because if we were given attention to everything that is perceivable within the universe, for want of a better term, we wouldn't be able to function within this reality. We would need, we need the wider information to be taken out in order to survive. You know, we can't, we can't all be fascinated by the, the turbulence in the sky as Van Gogh was. We can't all be seeing creatures here, there and everywhere because there's a saber toothed tiger in front of us possibly that is an even greater danger. So we have to exist within this world. For instance, a mother could not, a mother needs to focus in on her child. Uh, a hunter gatherer needs to make sure that he's out there providing for his family or his tribe. So this is something that I think we all have an innate ability for doing, but there's only a certain point within our own evolution that these abilities will become apparent. And I think we are now in the position that these these will become apparent purely and simply because we're now in a picture to understand them. Before for recent years, it would be very difficult for a writer like myself to get across some of the ideas I put across in the book, like the idea that the universe is in some deeply significant way digital and that matter itself is an emanation of digital information. And what we perceive around us is is, in fact, um, the mind forged manacles uh, or Philip K. Dick's um, black iron prison. And the evidence is getting stronger and stronger that this is the case. But on top of that, you know, we have recent developments. I saw something and I posted it on my Facebook wall last week, which is simply amazing. They have now designed um, a feedback suit that you wear like clothes and it feeds back your movements into a digital space on your computer screen. And of course, if you're wearing an Oculus Rift headset and a stereo headset, you are completely and utterly immersed in a digital reality. Now, to this, we now can see that and understand and perceive it. But 20 years ago, you know, the, the difficulty of, of getting across the idea of a digital reality that would be as real as any reality we perceive now, people just wouldn't get it. It would fly above their heads. It's funny as well that you mentioned Gary, because um, I just finished reading Gary's new book on um, Colin Wilson and blow, blew my mind. Excellent book. Great in fact, book. Gary, yeah, and Gary and I are meeting up over coffee next week because we are we are planning to, to take forward the, the Gary and Tony show at some time in the future. Wonderful. Can't wait for that. Absolutely. Because I know you're a huge fan of Gary's work and I know you've had Gary on a few times in your show because, I mean, he is such an intellect. You know, he is you know he makes me feel like a mental midget to be honest I mean, the <laughs> stuff he knows is just just phenomenal yes indeed and uh i love how you talk about the pleroma the gnostic pleroma of ancient times and uh, the truth is i think your views on the pleroma are probably pretty close to what the ancient gnostics thought and uh certainly carl jung thought that way maybe tell us tell the listener about uh, your your ideas on the pleroma yeah, it was something um, I touched upon in passing in a previous book that I co-authored with Irvin Laszlo called The Immortal Mind. And as you know, and probably your listeners know, but for those listeners who are not particularly au fait with Gnostic thought and Gnostic belief systems, the idea is that there is a reality behind this reality. And the reality that is behind is something called the pleroma, which means the fullness. It is it is the reality that, that hides as your, your website, you know, the God behind God. It's the idea that there is there is a, a curtain that keeps us in ignorance of the wider universe. Now, there is growing evidence that 
the pleroma that the Gnostics would have considered to be what they believe there to be the case is something probably similar to the zero point field um, that modern science is quite fascinated by. Because what it's been discovered is that at absolute zero or just above absolute zero, there really should be no energy. In other words, absolute zero by definition, you know, two, uh, two, seven, three point one five degree minus, minus two, seven, three, three, two, seven, three point one five degrees uh, Celsius. The reason it is absolute zero is there should be no energy. There should be no movement because at that point, everything stops. But they have found that when they take certain forms of hydrogen down to within a billionth of a degree of absolute zero, there is still energy coming from somewhere. There seems to be energy being drawn up from somewhere. And this energy is is considered to be everywhere. It's the energy between subatomic particles. It is literally the fullness that we consider to be the vacuum. So we're almost going back to the, the, the original concept of the luminiferous ether, the idea that that everything that is sort of hangs within this structure. Uh, and this structure seems to be a huge information field. And I argue that this is the pleroma. And I think, as you and I have agreed over the years, there are so many concepts and terms that one can lend one can borrow, I should say terrible use of grammar there, one can borrow from Gnosticism and Gnostic belief systems that can be wonderfully applied to the way in which modern science understands the nature of the universe. Now, if there is the case that the pleroma is the fullness that is ordinarily denied our perceptual field, I argue that under certain circumstances, certain individuals can perceive the pleroma as William Blake said, the doors of perception can be cleansed initially ever so slightly and then wider and wider. It's therefore overriding Huxley's um, reducing engine or Henri Bergson's concept of the brain as a reducing engine, overriding that and opening us up to a much wider area of perception. Um, and from this, I argue that if individuals are in the places they can go when they pick up, the, draw up the information from the information field, they go to a reality that is more real than this one. You know, because you can cite example after example of individuals who take DMT or have near death experiences, people who have out of the body experiences. They consistently state that the reality they go to is far more real than this one. This is the illusory world. This is the world of the senses, but it's not, we are not interfacing with the reality in the same way that they do when they're in these states of consciousness. Yes, and uh, what you talked about, the valve, reminds me of uh, Aldous Huxley talking about he was on mescaline, and he was obviously seeing the reality behind the reality, but he was also looking at his kitchen and telling himself, oh, at some point i got to wash my dishes. I mean, it's like there are these two realities we have to get to. And in your book, you talk a lot about the Huxleyan spectrum. What is that, Anthony? Right, the Huxley inspection, just just to, to go back slightly then, in terms of Aldous Huxley, um, when he wrote opening the when he wrote the doors of perception in 1954, and it's really intriguing this. The reason he managed to get hold of um, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 grams of mescaline was through the ministrations of um, a guy called Humphrey Osmond who was the president of the Souris Valley Mental Hospital in southern Saskatchewan, which apparently was the largest building in the British Empire in the 1950s. You know, so this really obscure place. But what Huxley had found from a paper that Osmond had written was that Osmond was working with people who had either intractable alcoholism or people who had schizophrenia. And what he found was he came to the conclusion, being somebody that understood the idea of the brain as a reducing valve, thought, well, if schizophrenics, their brain is so open to information, in order to bring that information field down for them, to turn down the, the, the signals they're receiving, we need to give them something. And he, he twigged upon the idea, let's give them a hallucinogenic substance. In other words, if, if a schizophrenic is so out there 
in terms of what they're perceiving. If you give them something that ordinarily with neurotypicals gives them a slight awareness of the pleroma, this will effectively bring the schizophrenic down from this madness to a more controllable area. And this is exactly what he discovered. So for, 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 for a general person, the idea of giving, giving a schizophrenic um, a hallucinogenic substance would be madness. But there, the schizophrenic's already out there in the mad world. So therefore, giving him something will reduce the effects. And this is what he discovered happened. And um, Huxley was so fascinated by this, he contacted Osmond and he said, can you get any hold of this stuff for me? Can you bring it down with you from Canada down to California? And Osmond did. And of course, opening the doors, uh, the doors of perception, the book is Huxley's description of exactly what happened to him. Now, in my book, Opening the Doors of Perception, I take Huxley's ideas and theories and update them for the 21st century in the light of 20, knowledge of 20, 21st century neurology, neurochemistry um, and even quantum physics. And I say, look, if we take what Huxley was saying and take into account what we now know about the workings of the brain, we can draw some fairly interesting conclusions. And what I argue in the book and what I present to the world, I suppose, for want of a better term, something I'm calling the Huxleyan spectrum. And this is a, a spectrum of syndromes, a spectrum of related illnesses in raised commas that systematically open the doors of perception wider and wider. Um, there is a continuum, and I discuss classic migraine, temporal lobe epilepsy, schizophrenia, autism, Asperger's, um, uh, savant syndrome, and various other things, Alzheimer's, for instance. And I, I present to my reader evidence that all of these conditions are neurologically related and that all of them are part of a continuum, which is why I call it the spectrum. And you write that Huxley was actually, wasn't he researching something for his bad eyesight? So maybe his uh, daemon was sort of guiding him towards this. That's right. One of the things I try to be careful in the book is to not necessarily bring in elements of my previous work. I do to an extent, but um, I, I argue in the book that the supporting material for my daemon and Adelon dyad which, which is effectively what I'm arguing here is that as the doors of perception are opened, the Edelon, which is the everyday self, the person embodied within the game, the sprite on the screen, as it were, is allowed to access the world of the daemon, which is the higher self, the, the daemon. Again, you and I both know, and for the listeners out there, the Edelon and the daemon were terms that were used by the Gnostics. Um, for millennia, well, definitely for two millennia anyway, and the the idea that we have two parts to our personality. There is the part that exists within the world, the Edelon, and there is the part of us that has the shard of the pleroma inside itself, the kind of the little bit of light that comes from outside, and that little bit of light is our access to the greater universe which, of course, in mystic systems has been used for centuries, hasn't it? You know, find the God inside, this kind of thing. So that's where that fits in, in many, many ways. But there is an underlying Gnosticism to everything I write. There is, and uh, of, uh, of the many things I enjoy about your work is you always talk about how Gnosticism is part of the mystery religion uh, stream. And uh, I like that because even today, most scholars, they don't touch that. For some reason, they avoided saying Gnosticism is just, was just part of Christianity. But when you read the Church Father writings, they're very specific. They, they say directly, no, the Gnostics were part of the, or they were the descendants of the Eleusinian mysteries. They wore the mask and did these theater rituals and these the grand magic, magic again rituals and they never spoke to people they, they they kept it in secrecy so i really like uh, i like that about your work and i'm glad you're you're continuing with it well i think it's very important here because one of the um the the, the individuals that i don't mention in this book but i do in opening the doors of uh, in um the infinite mind field is a guy called dr andreas mavromatis and andreas mavromatis is recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on hypnagogia and hypnopompia, you know, those liminal states just before we go to sleep and before we wake, where we seem to be able to access the pleroma 
And in that book, I argue we can access the pleroma during those circumstances because the um, the pineal gland is releasing endogenous dimethyltryptamine. And as such, we, we are effectively tripping. And of course, I argue that dimethyltryptamine is the key or one of the keys to the doors of perception. Um, and he... He has written two books. One book is is called Hypnagogia, but his second book, if anybody hasn't read it, really should get hold of a copy of it. It's actually called Traveling Light. And in this, he describes his own initiation into a Gnostic group on the Greek island of Poros in the 1960s. Um, and in it, he describes this group and the master that he worked with within the group and this guy is 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 phenomenal the the story that Mavramatis tells about his his work with this guy this guy is a typical shape-shifting shaman you know it's very much almost greek shamanism and one of the things that Mavramatis cites time and time again is the way in which greek mysticism and greek shamanism which most people wouldn't even associate with with greece in terms of shamanism and everything else is has its roots really definitely within the the Eleusian mysteries within the way in which the Eleusian mysteries carry through into Gnosticism because of course Gnosticism spread through the Greek speaking world I mean it was a Greek Christian belief system that had taken the belief systems of the 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 the, the, the ancient Greeks and had melded them into the modern world of thinking so they brought together the Christian ideas in the most wonderful way um, and it works. It has its inner logic because, of course, that's the whole thing of Gnosticism, isn't it? It takes away the the illogicality of much of Christianity because, of course, Gnosticism addresses fully the mystery of why there is evil in the universe. Because a good God could not create evil. How could he? It would be a contradiction in terms. And then we see the God of the Old Testament, you know, smiting people here, there and everywhere and being an overall complete bastard. And clearly, whatever that entity is, it's not our idea of what we would call the Christian God. And, you know, as Gnostics say, we get over this this particular theological conundrum by positing that this is not the real God. It's the it's the demiurge. It's it's Yaldabaoth. It's the the semi the the, the, the half maker. And this universe is created by him. Now, this is, has deep, deep resonance with modern science. You know, the idea of, of how we perceive reality, that reality is, is created by the brain and it's modeled internally and presented to us in a particular way. And that way could be the way in which the brain, as it's structured now, denies us the access to the broader pleroma, as it were. Yes, and it's of course a historical fact that Pythagoras was deputized by a Mongolian shaman, and that the uh, historian said that the Gnostics were Neo-Pythagoreans, that they drew directly from his wisdom, his mystic rites, and so forth. So this is historical, and what I like about your work, too, is that you're not just, again, some guy on the street corner talking about reality or anything like that. You, Everything you do, you back up with scientific and historical data. Well, that's so important. Um, and it's something that I think is both a negative thing as the way my work is, 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 is represented or misrepresented out there in the general uh, news sphere, in that a lot of people don't get me. Um, they, they jump to the conclusion that because of my book titles and because of the fact that my books are generally found in the new age areas of books, that I'm some kind of lightweight is the wrong term but somebody who's going to be describing their experiences or somebody that's going to be trying to sell a technique whereby you can get out of your body or you can have a near-death experience or whatever and this is categorically what i don't do all i do is present the evidence in other words i i look at the experiential and i point out that people have for as long as records have been kept had extraordinary experiences from near-death experiences to out-of-the-body experiences to encounters with entities and it goes throughout history and it goes across all cultures 
Now, clearly, as, as, as a sociologist by training and a historian by training, I look at these things as a social scientist would look at them. In other words, I look at them and say, people don't generally make these things up. They will embroider a circumstance and they will elaborate on an experience they've had. But the inner core experience, the consistency comes through time and time again. So I argue that if these things are perceptual experiences, we it is bad science to literally just pretend that they are beyond scientific understanding because they're not real. They are hallucinations. And this is the central theme of the new book is exactly what are hallucinations and how is it that modern science and modern materialist reductionist science can dismiss somebody having the most incredible personal experience by just giving it the label. It's an hallucination when, it, when they never, ever then turn around and say, and of course, we understand what hallucinations are because they don't. You know, Oliver Sacks, um, the late Oliver Sacks, the very last book he wrote was called Hallucinations. And in this book, he describes many hallucinations that his patients, uh, Oliver Sacks was a, was a psychiatrist in New York, an English psychiatrist in New York. Uh, he was, in fact, the guy in um, uh, Awakenings that, um, that, he, that Robin Williams took off the doctor when these people were coming out of um, decades of being caught in, 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 in Parksonianism and sleeping sickness who were given a drug called L-Dopa, which opened them up and brought them back into this world. And these people had been away, they thought, for literally seconds, whereas they'd been away for decades in this kind of dream world. Now, Sachs really is honest enough to say that we don't really know what hallucinations are. But from there, there's been a lot of work done. There's, there's a couple called uh, the Celia Green and uh, a guy called McCreary who have something called a metachoric model of hallucinations. And this is profoundly Gnostic because in the metachoric model, model, what they're suggesting is that everything is an hallucination. You know, to just have the borderline and say that that is an hallucination because it's not consensual or you don't share it with somebody else. Therefore, that's not real. But they're all brain generated. You know, the external world and our perception of the external world is as much brain generated as any hallucination is. And recent research has been done where they have... Um, taken individuals who have been hallucinating and they have done brain scans of those individuals, PET scans, and the same areas of the brain light up as if they were having a natural experience. Uh, for instance, one of the fascinating ones was where they asked somebody, when they were testing this out objectively, and they asked somebody to, in their mind's eye, imagine playing tennis. And then they, 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 they tested somebody when they were playing tennis. And the, the similarities that the same areas of brain light up. So internally, it's an identical experience. And of course, we have the problem generally with, with uh, um, the labeling theory of hallucinations, that if Miguel and I, Miguel and Tony both share an experience and both share uh, a, an hallucination, they have an answer for that. They call it a folie a deux. But that's not an answer. It's a label. You know, they haven't explained it. They haven't explained how two individuals ca can spontaneously see the same thing in three dimensional consensual space. And indeed, by going down that path, they're going to a very dangerous area because they are suggesting telepathy, which, of course, is something else that's forbidden within scientism. You know, we cannot supposedly communicate at a distance from our brain, one brain to another. So they effectively try attempt an explanation of one phenomena with another. So they have issues here. But the the idea of hallucinations themselves are intriguing. Um, in the book, I point out that when you have an hallucination, um, there, there is an example that I think it's Oliver Sacks. It might be Ramachandran, the, the neuro, neuroscientist. I think it is Ramachandran. And Ramachandran is describing how one of his patients hallucinated um, a, a, a monkey sitting on Ramachandran's lap while Ramachandran was, um, was, was doing work with him. And Ramachandran just describes, and the bloke says, oh, you know, there's a monkey sitting on your lap and it's, it's playing with your hair and it's doing all these things. And Ramachandran says it's a really fascinating hallucination. 
It's more than a fascinating hallucination because, as McCreary and Green would argue, there are two hallucinations going on there. There's the hallucination of the monkey, which seems to have its own motivations. And this is the curious thing. These hallucinations seem to have motivated power and, and power in themselves. They want to do things. They're not just being stimulated by the brain. They have independence of motivation. But on top of that, the very fact that the patient could not see the areas of Ramachandran's body that were occluded by the monkey means there's two hallucinations going on. There's the hallucination that is putting the monkey there. And there's also the hallucination that's taking out the area of the patient's visual field to accommodate the monkey. And people very rarely touch upon that. People never seem to think logically, what does your explanation imply and suggest? So clearly here we have an area where hallucinations seem to be more real. And in the book, I propose that in many ways, these hallucinations are real in the sense that reality is real or not real. So I cite the examples, for instance, and something that fascinates me is something called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, Charles Bonnet syndrome is a known syndrome. It's in the American definitions of, of known psychological states, and it is comparatively common. And Charles Bonnet syndrome is where people who are partially sighted see little people. In fact, uh, Hirik Husfeldt, who is um, an American novelist, a young-ish American novelist, by the way, um, when she was younger, used to have profound um, migraine auras. And during her migraine auras, she would see little people. She explains in one of her books how she saw a group of little, a little, no, was it a little um, farmer? come into her bedroom when she was a child, pulling a little cow with him. And he was about, I don't know, about eight inches tall. And then a little police car turns up. Another little policeman get out and start haranguing him. Now, all this thing was happening in her perceptual space, involving events that were not being created by her mind. Because why would a child's mind spontaneously create such an image? It makes no sense. But things got stranger because... I have personal knowledge and experience of just how powerful Charles Bonnet syndrome can be because my mother, who has now been diagnosed with and in fact is in semi-catatonic state with Alzheimer's, started developing Charles Bonnet syndrome around about 10 years ago. And it started in the most bizarre fashion because she she saw what she thought was a flying machine. Um, really quite strange. She wouldn't know a UFO if it got a bitter on the bottom, but she saw what looked like a classic UFO. And then two days later, she wakes up in the middle of the night and the door is open. Now she's, she's partially sighted. She lost one, her eye with malignant melanoma. She lives on her own. My father died many years ago. So you can imagine how disturbed she is. She wakes up in the middle of the night in clearly a state of probably sleep paralysis. Uh, and in a state of, of hypnagogia, or probably hypnopompia if she'd just woken up. And she noticed that the bedroom door was open. And then as she's looking at the bedroom door, she sees a group of tiny thin fingers come around the edge of the door. And she describes a little creature that popped its head around the door that had huge black eyes, two little holes for nostrils and a slit for a mouth. And it saw her and dodged back. But she couldn't move. So she was in a state of, of, of sleep paralysis. And then she drops off to sleep and she wakes up the next morning. She's in a state of absolute terror. And she phones me up and says, what have I seen? I tried to calm her down. Now, again, my mother knows nothing about UFO law, but effectively she'd seen a grey. Now, if we look back in history, we will find that throughout history, read the writings of Jacques Vallée um, and um, Evans Wentz and, and the anthropologist Evans Wentz. Um, and various other writers on both UFO phenomena and the little people in the, in the Celtic cultures. You will find that these creatures have been with us forever. They are an elemental part of being human. And they somehow seem to be breakthroughs from the pleroma. They seem to be things coming in from the pleroma. 
Now, whether they are they have independent existence is beside the point. One could argue that they are archetypes, Jungian archetypes, this kind of thing. But they seem to have independent existence. This creature saw my my mother and was surprised that it was being seen. Now, how my mother could create an image based upon something like the front cover of Whitley Strieber's book Communion, I have no idea. She's never she doesn't watch UFO programs. She doesn't read UFO books. I think the only alien that she's ever really known anything about was E.T. And whatever this creature was, it wasn't E.T. because E.T. had huge eyes, completely different image. So I calmed her down and everything else. And then I started. She then started to say she was seeing little children running around her singing to her. She said these little people around me talking, they sing to me. And I'm thinking, wow, 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 there's something really weird going on here, you know, make with the um, Out of Limits music. But there does seem to be something rather peculiar going on. And then she says about the friendly old man that always smiles at her in the kitchen. And I said, what, there's a man that comes in to see you? No, 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 he's always there. And I'm going, mum, there is nobody there. Oh, yes, he is. He's very friendly. He's very nice. And I then take her, I start getting concerned because she started to, to have other erratic behaviours. So I took her to the doctor. And I said to the doctor, um, I think my mother has Charles Bonnet syndrome. I also think that these are the precursors of Alzheimer's. And the doctor didn't believe me. And in fact, the doctor had never heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome. Not that it's surprising. Why should a doctor know of these things? (laughs) And I'd strongly suggested that the doctor look up Charles Bonnet syndrome, which the doctor subsequently did and said, yes, I think you've got a point here. So mum had a series of tests. And yes, we, we got the the diagnosis of Alzheimer's and she's then slid into this, this strange world. Whereas now I miss, I saw her over the weekend and she's just catatonic. Now she, she has not recognize you. She just stirs into space. But I think what happens with Alzheimer's is that as somebody gets towards the end of their life, which effectively Alzheimer's is the doors of perception start to open because the person is being prepared for their moving from this world, the illusory world, into something different. And the doors are starting to open automatically. Whereas with people with migraine, people with schizophrenia, people with TLE, the doors are open because of of, of neurochemical accidents. Whereas with Alzheimer's, it's quite different. And, you know, there is so much evidence about this and just how powerful this is because my mother has something called dementia with Lewy bodies DLB and it's this is to do with how there are certain things created in the brain now for instance research tells me that the reason that Alzheimer's does so much damage is there are things called tubulin associated units or tau's and these tubulin associated units break down structures in the neurons of the brain called the microtubules. Now, you and I, I think, have discussed in the past, and I know we've discussed in many of my interviews, my interest in the work of Stuart Hammerhoff, Professor Stuart Hammerhoff and Professor Roger Penrose. And Hammerhoff and Penrose have something called uh, orchestrated um, objective reduction theory, whereby the microtubules in the brain are what draws up information from the zero point field to create the illusionary reality we live within. Guess what? Alzheimer's breaks down the, 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 uh, the cells, breaks down the microtubules. It actually destroys them. It blows them up. So what is happening here is that the, 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 the communication channels with this world that we live within, the microtubules are keeping us within, are being destroyed by the the Tao and in destroying it they open up other avenues of communication and I believe these other avenues of communication are the structures in the brain known as glial cells nine you know where you hear the sign where people turn around and say 15 percent we only use 15 percent of our brains it's it's one of these tropes very few people actually know what that means what it means is that 15 percent of the brain is made up of neurons you know, the net, the cells that communicate neurochemically and the, the synaptic gap and little chemicals get fired across and there's receiver sites and everything else. But the balance of the brain and the, 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 the remaining 85% of the brain is made up of cells called glial cells. 
And modern neurology really has no idea what these cells are for. Now, there's the law of parsonomy in, 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 in all things to do with the development of biology. You don't have things that are there that are not necessary. You know, it, why would we evolve that amount of redundancy in the brain? You know, it's rather similar to two other things. Um, uh, junk DNA, which I believe is not junk DNA, and I touched upon this in the book, and dark matter and dark energy. There seems to be we have this worldview that the brain is neurons, even though most of it, we don't understand what it does. That um, matter is made up of matter rather than dark matter and dark energy, which is the vast majority of what's out there. And we also have the vast majority of our genome, which is made up of junk DNA that we don't know what it's for either. So we've got this tiny snapshot of what reality is. But what is particularly fascinating is that there is something called cortical spreading depression, CSD. This is depolarization across the brain, and this runs through the glial cells. It doesn't run through the neurons. So there is a communication system within our brain that we don't use for our everyday perceptions of consensual reality. I believe that the glial cells are there because they are part of the, the wider perception. They are our receivers of the pleroma. Now, there has been recent research arguing that the glial cells themselves actually communicate non-locally. Now, we know from quantum physics that non-locality is one of the great mysteries whereby subatomic particles can communicate instantaneously. But if the brain works non-locally, this can explain so many issues that modern neurology and neuropsychology and uh, neurochemistry cannot explain. There's something called a binding problem. They can't explain the binding problem, how it is that everything seems to be simultaneous. In other words, everything seems to be happening to you and I now, even though different parts of the brain are processing different bits of the information field we are perceiving. And yet they seem to be able to bring them all together at a point in the brain where everything is simultaneous. So, for instance, I see a red ball dancing, bouncing down the road. The red of the ball is being processed in one part of the brain and the bouncing movement is being processed somewhere else. And yet I see a red bouncing ball. But there must should be a delay of where the, where the signal is coming from where it's being processed for the, the red. And then that signals something and it goes somewhere. And then the bouncing from another part of the brain goes somewhere, which means the two of them must intersect. The two signals must intersect somewhere in order for us to perceive the red bouncing ball. Now, this is called the binding problem because they've never been able to find where the, inter where the intersection points are. There are no intersection points. The brain is non-local. The brain works under holographic principles and it's the glial cells that do this. Now, if this is the case and the brain works holographically, this then suggests that reality is also holographic and that we have a, an internal hologram creator of holograms, creating the external world out of the information field that is the zero point field. So therefore, the consensual hallucination and the non-consensual hallucinations are both equally real in terms of what we consider reality to be. The only thing is that the consensual reality that you and I are now sharing is the consensual reality of beings who are embodied within the program within the matrix, within the, the black iron prism. But what we're starting to do now is to be able to do the science of understanding how the neurology works that allows us to access the broader horizons. And I genuinely believe I am the only writer on the planet doing this. Everybody else is fiddling around with near death experiences and fiddling around with the out of body experience and fiddling around with mediumship. I'm the only person joining the dots. And one day, there's, somebody's going to pick up one of my books and go, bloody hell, this guy's joined the dots. But at the moment, there isn't anybody picking it up because nobody, no, probably very few people see it from my point of view because I pulled it all together. So therefore, I know the power of the arguments I can put forward. I know just how powerful the science is. I've researched in phenomenal detail. Now, people argue and they turn around to me and they'll say, you're not qualified 
to do this. You know, you don't have a PhD in this and that and the other. Well, I'd argue nobody on the planet is qualified to do this because I'll guarantee there is not one human being on the planet that has a PhD in neurology, neurochemistry, PhDs in neurology, neurochemistry, psychiatry, psychology, cosmology, Gnosticism. The list goes on and on and on. But what I'm doing is pulling them all together and saying, look, somebody has to have an overview of all this. And I know just how powerful my argument is. And this is why sometimes, and I do apologize out there, why I sometimes throw my toys out the pram on Facebook. It's because I'm screaming out saying, for God's sake, guys, listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> and they're all ignoring me and they're all dissing me and they're all putting articles up saying, you know, like on rational wiki to say Anthony Peake has no scientific qualifications. And I keep going back to these people and saying, anytime you want to sit down and discuss me face to face to find out just how much I do know about quantum physics or just how much I do know about neurology. Because I always say to people, how deep do you want to go? How deep do you want to wrestle with me into the mud and the depths of my understanding of what, how neurology works and how quantum physics works? You know, I do know the difference. I do know why certain things are believed within quantum physics. I do understand the principle of why, for instance, we believe dark matter exists and dark energy exists. I know it's to do with the revolution of the galaxies. I know this. You know, but I'll guarantee there's very few neurologists that know that. Um, so, you know, there's my little rant over. <laughs> but um, it is it is somewhat frustrating. But I, but I am starting the first moves to give myself the academic uh, academic credibility because you know I do have a degree and I do I have studies at studied at postgraduate level at one of the world's top universities in London School of Economics, and I'm now negotiating doing my PhD. Because there are scientists out there who are picking up my material now and going, shit, do you want a PhD, mate? <laughs> and this is happening. This is happening. I literally got an email today, you know. Uh, so the new book is starting to break through. And it's breaking through the barriers because what is happening here is that there are so many what I would call snake oil salesmen out there selling nonsense. They get hold of quantum physics and they, they – come up with quantum healing oh, and yeah. crap like that. Then you've got other ones, you know, that people are the shape-shifting lizards coming through and the world is ruled by shape-shifting lizards. It's far more complex than that and it's far more intriguing than that. You know, the whole simulation argument put forward by Nick Bostrom in 2003, David Chalmers' hard problem. These, these are really, really meaty ideas. And all we need to do is join the dots. It's all we do. It's like a huge jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces are there. It's just we're not we're all too siloed, you know, and then and I think the final I think the the glow for this all is Gnosticism, because Gnosticism contains all these ideas. It never ceases to amaze me the more I read about Gnosticism. I'll go, shit, how did they know that? And of course they knew that because they were mystics. They knew that because they knew it naturally. They knew it instinctively. You know, it could be that Gnosticism was, in fact, the science of a previous civilization that was on this planet. Who knows that these are the the bits and pieces of the things that have come down through history that, that have been interpreted by more primitive peoples as we have degraded. But they, they, they have truth. You know, you, you, you and I both know, you know, you read some of the stuff in the Kabbalah, you know, and you're going, woof. The idea of the orain soft, the idea of the singularity. These things are all there. And of course, Kabbalah is just the Jewish version of Gnosticism. You read Sufism. Some of the, the, the stories in Sufism, you know, the, 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 the are just absolutely incredible. And you read them and you realize that they're hiding in plain sight. They're giving fantastic truths. And this is not just me interpreting these things. It is obvious this is what they're saying. You know, they speak in parables, but the parables are very, very powerful. And the parables are obvious. I would agree. And uh, that was a great rant. And I'm going <laughs> to give, give you a rave. And uh, unfortunately, Anthony, yeah, we do live in this uh, materialistic paradigm where everything is specialized. Nobody communicates. And of course, the first action to most people is go for the ad hominem, which I've seen them doing to you. And of course, they skip over the data as always in your book. 
brings plenty of data. But ultimately, I think your work is altruistic because you are offering, again, different paradigms for those who are suffering from uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, Savant syndrome, migraines, and so forth. And what you're doing is really getting to the crux of, uh, I would say, the survival of humanity because once upon a time, the shaman in ancient times was the one who might have migraines, who might have uh, epileptic seizures and so forth. And this was considered a gift because they saw the reality behind the reality. And these shamans were instrumental in the survival of the tribe. Not only the survival, but the shamans were the ones who guided the tribe to learn about science, uh, reading, writing, medicine, and all that, and we've seemed to have lost that, and I think your work will get us closer to bringing, again, that shamanistic, Gnostic, ecstatic attitude that really advanced civilization once upon a time. Uh, totally. Um, in my book, The Infinite Mindfield, I cite the discovery of ayahuasca by the shamans um, down in, um, in uh, Amazonia. And this is fascinating. As you probably know, DMT, uh, ayahuasca is made up of two separate plants. There's Banisterius capi, which is a vine. And, uh, and Banisterius capi, you know, contains something I'm going to touch on in a second. And Psychiatra viridas, which contains DMT, dimethyltryptamine. And it's in the leaves of the, the, the viridas. Now, you can eat as many leaves as you like of Psychiatra viridas. And they'll go into your stomach and you will never, ever have an altered state of consciousness. And the reason you won't is that the, the stomach releases something called monoamine oxidase. A monoamine oxidase effectively nullifies the hallucinogenic effect. Well, it doesn't nullify the hallucinogenic effect. It actually stops the hallucinogenics traveling through from the stomach and from the liver and everything else into the bloodstream. It stops it happening. Now, the... Intriguing thing is that Banisterius capi contains a substance, I think it's called harmaline, or it begins with an H anyway, and that is an, an, an MAO inhibitor. So in effect, by mixing the two plants together, you take them and you ingest it, and when the, the, psychi psychi uh, the psychoactive substance gets into the stomach, when the MAO starts to come out to stop it, crossing into the bloodstream, the MAO inhibitor comes out and stops it doing it, giving free passage of the psychiatric substance into the bloodstream. Now, there are, I think, last count, around about 80,000 different varieties of plants in the Amazonian basin. The shamans managed to bring together the two plants they needed to in order to ensure that ayahuasca was effective. Now, the anthropologists were intrigued by this, and they, they asked the shamans how they ever came across this particular mixture. And they had a straightforward answer. They said, when we go shamanic, when we used to go shamanic traveling, or historically when the shamans went shamanic traveling, which they could do spontaneously, because as you quite rightly say, they normally were people who had TLA, definitely migraine and probably TLA, and many of them were schizophrenic. And we know this. We know this from the books that have been written. It was called the diviner's disease. Temporal lobe epilepsy was the diviner's disease. So the falling sickness. So we know that these individuals can automatically go into these states. When they were in the States, they would, as you know, a shaman would go into the upper world or the lower world and they would seek out their totemic animal. Most shamans totems would be snakes and the snakes would come to them and would explain to them and take them into the jungle and point out to them the plants that they had to pick. In other words, something subliminal within the shamans themselves was telling them like it was almost a race memory. Only I believe it's more than that. I believe that the, D that the snakes are symbolic of our own DNA and it's our own DNA telling us how we can evolve to the next stage of, 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 of the way human beings are evolving. Because, and this is a, the super because, is because 
It was discovered in uh, 2000, and, ooh, I think 2011 through 2010, something like that, by um, a researcher called Jimo Borjijin, a Japanese um, neurologist. She discovered DMT in the pineal gland of live rats. Okay, so for the first time, we know that DMT is active in a live mammalian brain. This then explains the existence of one or two mysterious receptor sites within the brain, particularly the trace amine associated receptors, the TARs, and something called the sigma one receptors. They were never quite sure what these were for when they were discovered. They work with DMT, which effectively means that DMT has evolved and hard programmed within our DNA sequence to be evolved within our brains to be released at a certain time. I argue that people who can open the doors of perception, people who have Alzheimer's, people who have migraine, schizophrenia and various other things, I believe access the pleroma through the release of DMT within the brain. Now, again, the picture is starting to fall into place because if DNA is the thing that's driving this, it's part of evolution and it allows us to see the world behind the world. So we seem to be at a very, very crucial period of human history here because suddenly we can understand the analogy of existing within a computer program because we have the technology to understand it. We have writers such as Nick Bostrom and various other writers and researchers such as uh, Craig Hogan, Professor Craig Hogan of the, um, the Perimeter Institute in the States, who's doing research as we speak to prove that the universe is a hologram. This is serious research. This is not cloud cuckoo. And this guy is seriously doing the business. They think that they found that the universe is digital and is a hologram, and it's to do with the behavior of black holes. It's to do with the loss of information within black holes and the second law of thermodynamics, where you can't lose information. But if you throw a book or a computer system into a black hole, it effectively disappears. It just goes from existence. And that cannot be possible within scientific understanding of how energy works. Also, there are people like Vlatko Vedrel, uh, a quantum, one of the, the top quant, young quantum physicists that are coming up at the moment. Vlatko Vedrel, who is university, is in the University of Singapore and the University of Cambridge. He, he does a dual role. His books present the evidence, and it is so powerful, that matter is not the base of everything. We assume that matter is what all there is. Matter is is predicated, is created by information. There is no matter. It is digital information, non-physical digital information that creates the physical world that we see around us. And that physical world, that non, that digital information is created by the brain and expanded outwards into three-dimensional reality. So suddenly we have this kind of incredibly complex world of wheels within wheels, which is exactly what the Gnostics have been arguing. It's incredible. I, I sit down sometimes and I, I sit down and I think, OK, where's the where's the gap in my logic? Where is the bit I'm missing? Where is the where is the leap of assumption I have made that 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 that, that, that makes people question where I'm going with this? Now, I can't find it. I really can't find it. And if somebody can come along and say, you've jumped to conclusions about this, or you've misinterpreted what Craig Hogan is saying, or you've misinterpreted the, the work of Jimo Borjijin. I've spoken to Jimo Borjijin. We've swapped emails. I'm right. What she's saying, she has discovered DMT in the brain of live rats. There is no question. But nobody's talking about it. And they're not talking about it because they're probably shit scared about it. Because suddenly... What does this say about reality? And then they turn around and say, well, let's just place Tony Peak, Anthony Peak with David Icke and David Wilcock and everybody else, all those other strange guys that have these really weird ideas. And if we can keep him with them, we can keep him out of the mainstream. Just keep him there, tar him with the same brush. But I'm breaking out. And lots more people and a lot more scientists are coming to me now and saying, you know what? 
you've actually nailed it on the head. And suddenly I'm moving away and suddenly the ad hominem attacks are suddenly disappearing as more and more scientists are coming to me to say, you know, although I can't say it officially, you're onto something. So let's see what, where we go from here. Agreed, agreed. It's, uh, it's very fascinating, very fascinating work you're doing. But at the same time, and you yourself advocate this, we can't get too stuck on the image. Uh, Whitley Stryber, he wrote the foreword to your book, Opening the Doors of Perception. In his book, his, his most recent book, Supernatural, which he co-wrote with uh, Jeff Kripal, he was asked, why do aliens appear like little bug-eyed midgets and so forth? And he said, well, maybe we need to start making better science fiction movies. In other words, yeah. we're still stuck in the image. What did the Gnostics say? Truth did not come naked. It came in images. And as you write, the daemon is still going to give us the images that we know of our times. The Matrix, Philip K. Dick, and so forth. The mythology. Spot on, absolutely. What we, what we, don't, un, don't, what we don't realize is, in many times, that we exist within a world of archetypes. You know, we we extrapolate what's inside our heads and what's in the way. And this is where we have the kind of double mirror, don't we? You know, we have the the imagery which Hollywood gives us about reality, which is reflecting the deeper reality. But what is the real source? Now, Je Jeff Krippel, that, that the book uh, Supernature by Jeff and um, funny enough, Jeff was supposed to be writing a review for the, the, the book as well. Uh, and sadly, his dog died. Um, so he was quite distraught. So didn't get around Sorry to it. To hear that. But he's he he seems to really be a huge fan of my work, which is really great because I'm a huge fan of his. Um, I think his work is really breaking the boundaries because there are a lot of writers out there. But we 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 do we have again the bits of the the jigsaw puzzle are there, but he's still trying to put them together. But of course, as you and I have both said. If we are inside the matrix, if we are inside the mind forge manacles and the archons are keeping us in here. And I know you and I talk about the archons jokingly. There are some people out there that we believe we're serious. <laughs> you know. Facebook, by, the way, guys, asking <laughs> by the way, guys, we are not serious. It's an analogy. It, the archons, we don't really believe they exist in the way that you believe they exist. But if there is an Agent Smith or some kind of control mechanism that wants to keep us within the restricted worldview that we have, the kind of stuff that you and I are doing can be very, very dangerous. Because if everybody did realize that this was a form of simulation, we'd all stop doing everything and starve to death. Because we still need to exist within these meat machines, within whatever this reality is. This reality does need us to be able to generate energy in order to continue going on. And we can't just stop, otherwise we die. But what do we do when we die? We, 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 where our energy changes into another energy form or we move into a different perception of time. But it's who is who are the designers? And, you know, there's been a lot of work done on this and there's a lot of papers being written on it. Again, Nick Bostrom with his paper is suggesting that the designers of this game are ourselves in our own future. There are descendants. We are in an ancestor simulation. And the ancestor simulation is the reality we're within. And within the ancestor simulation, you also create the archetypes. You also create the hopes and fears and everything else of everybody's brains. So, for instance, I, I came across something recently, which I think I really need to follow up on, is that there is a young woman in Australia um, whose name escapes me, who remembers... Uh, Rebecca Sharrock, that's it. I remember that because Glenn Sharrock used to be the lead singer of, this is how my mind works, Glenn Sharrock used to be the lead singer of the Little River Band. Glenn Sharrock is Australian. Therefore, this girl must have a similar name. And it's, yeah, it's Rebecca Sharrock. And she remembers, she has autism. She has profound autism. She remembers everything that's ever happened to her since the age of 10 or something or something younger, you know. And... She's what's called, she has what's called HSAM, which is Highly Superior Autographical Memory, also known as hypothermistic Syndrome, which I posted about in the past in, in various places. And hypothermistic sim um, Syndrome is super memory. She even remembers her dreams. Now, if she remembers her dreams, it means that the dreams are also encoded within the program. So our hopes and our fears, these are archetypes, are all part of the program so they can manifest it doesn't matter whether we define them as being real or not. 
anything that can affect us emotionally is real. So we have to be very, very careful with these scenarios. You know, what, you know, I, I've, um, some of the work done at the moment, there's a lady called Og, Olga Bogdashina, who is doing a lot of work with autistic children and saying, like I'm saying, that they can perceive a reality outside of reality. For instance, most people who are involved in autism um, know something called the intense world syndrome, which was put forward by um, Henry and Camilla Markham. And the intense world syndrome is arguing what I'm saying. Is their doors of perception are open? In fact, they use the term the shower, the shower uh, curtain effect. In other words, most of us, we have a shower, we have our minds is like a shower and there's a shower curtain that keeps everything in. But when you become autistic, the shower curtain disappears and the water splays everywhere and you can't deal with it. So clearly there is something here to linking again with this whole worldview. I mean, I, there's, a, there's a lady that I interviewed on my own radio show, which we might try and get on our future plans at some day, it's called Diane Hennessy Powell. And she has a little girl that is is telepathic, period. She proved it. There, there is no doubt this child is telepathic. Um, and I think she was on um, some major show in America recently, uh, Opera Winfrey maybe. But she and I have been in touch now for the last 18 months. She's a top neurologist. You know, she's not some person down the pub you've met that has a crazy idea. This woman is a serious researcher. Also, she's working with her brother, who's a quantum physicist, on this whole idea of autism and, tel and telepathy. This child reads people's minds. Um, how? I don't know, but she does. This might be the only show ever where the lizard people and the little river band have been mentioned it together. <laughs> I, I might be having some great hallucinations later on with this. Funnily, funnily, funnily enough, Miguel, there's a nice link here because the um, the lead guitarist of the Little River Band is um, a guy called Graham Goble, G-R-A-E-M-E, -E, Graham Goble. And I contacted Graham um, because some of the lyrics, you, do you know the Little River Band? Oh, yeah, yeah. I used to oh, great. To so you love them. So some of Graham's lyrics are really quite intriguing. And I contacted him and I discovered that he has these kind of experiences all the time. And his writing is based upon his experiences. Um, and he asked, could I send him a copy of my books? Uh, and it's unfortunate I missed him. I was down in Australia lecturing in January and I missed the opportunity to meet him. So you're suddenly finding that there are, there are quite intriguing people out there, quite famous people who have extraordinary experiences. And all we need to do is to pull them on board you know, but of course, all that will happen is then they will be labelled as being crazy. Right. Fortunately, Graham Graham doesn't keep this secret at all. And of course, Graham only what was it two years ago was um, if you go onto or go onto YouTube, there he is singing with um, singing the harmonies on Desperado with uh, Glenn Frey. You know, in front of thousands of people. You know, this guy is a seriously considered musician and all his latest albums are all to do with his out-of-body states and his perceptions and for the listener uh there is plenty of examples and research in anthony's book and of course for the detractors uh please take a look at the research but um before we end anthony i wanted to get to one specific uh example one of the many that blew me away and that's when you're talking your section of your book about the entrance and that's vincent van gogh and his uh artwork in starry night that was amazing what you found oh it's, it's absolutely incredible i was stunned by this i've written about um vincent van gogh um in the past but i i'd never really realized that exactly what was taking place in his mind um the, the the i think the guy's dutch and they've, they've done a lot of research in in looking at the way in which starry night the way in which the swirls work and he was painting turbulence accurately painting turbulence that you cannot see that's in the sky he was seeing things that are there that ordinary sight does not show and the reason they were fascinated by this was Turbulence is a really difficult thing to predict its movements and, and how turbulence develops. And his pictures apparently are absolutely accurate to how turbulence fields would look, would be. 
Now, this then starts to explain a lot of the things that were happening with Vincent van Gogh, because he started to act very, very strangely. He started to see visions. He, he started, he became very religious at one stage. His doors of perception were being opened and he was trying to paint the world that he was seeing. Now, in the book, I discuss another phenomenon known as cliverform constants, which were put, suggested by Henry Cliver in 1926. And these are images that people know. I'm a classic migrainer, so I know exactly what they're describing when they're talking about cliverform constants. They're the things I see when I'm in an aura state. But if you look at the, 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 the intense colours of what he was painting, he was painting his migraines. You know, the yellows are really the kind of yellows you see when you're, you're in a, 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 an aura state in my classic migraine. You know, you could feel the kind of sickness almost that he had. And of course, what he was having was that, that reality was breaking through in some way. Now, I think there were, there were probably other issues with him, which I think are not dissimilar to our mutual friend Philip K. Dick. Um, in the sense, of course, Philip K. Dick's doors of perception were flung wide open in 2374. His 2374 and his, his theophany. And again, you know, with Phil... I diagnose that I think what was happening with Phil, he was having trans transitory ischemic um, attacks. In other words, he was having mini strokes in his brain and the mini strokes were opening up the doors of perception. They were shattering in some way his microtubules in, in his neurons, maybe, which was meaning that the microtubules weren't functioning. So he needed to fall back upon his the astroglial network the glial network in the brain, and suddenly he's moving from the normal 15% of the brain and being smashed into the, the majority of the brain, which is non-local, and can pick up information from the zero-point field. So Van Gogh, lots of other artists as well, seem to have this sensation. I have a whole section on Strindberg, and in fact the parallels between Strindberg and Philip K. Dick are, are phenomenal. <laughs> I really was quite stunned by this. So clearly, and of course, the major chapter in the book is a description of the experiences of Eben Alexander, the neurosurgeon who had who didn't believe in near death experiences, thought they were hallucinations and a load of rubbish till he actually had one himself, as is always the case that you think these things are total nonsense till it happens to you. And then suddenly, wow, what have I, what have I been preaching all my life? Total bollocks. What I've been preaching is scientism. These things do happen. And, you know, Eben Alexander had the most amazing experience. And in the book, I analyze his experience as he doesn't. I analyze his experience as a DMT experience. And I analyze it in such a way that I bring in such things as uh, Terence McKenna, the DMT dome experience that he has. There's also the chrysanthemum effect, which is known in DMT. And if you if a, and this is the other thing where people aren't joining the dots and there's parallels. The people who are in the DMT field. The Rick Strassmans of this world and the other researchers in DMT and ayahuasca are not reading near-death experiences. They're not reading. I guarantee that there's only going to be a handful of people out there who are into DMT who've re read Rick, have, have read the Eben Alexander book. Because if you read it and you know about the, the entities, the machine elves and everything else that McKenna talks about, geez, he's having it. He's doing it. For the listener, uh, the book is Opening the Doors of Perception, the Key to Cosmic Awareness. Uh, this is uh, Aeon by Gnostic Radio doing our Schrodinger's Diary series. At You can find this at thegodabovegod.com. And for more information on Anthony, certainly go to anthonypeak.com. That's P-E-A-K-E.com. But I think that's all the time we have today, Anthony. And just, like just to... Yeah, just to say quickly, Miguel, that's a brand. It's a brand new website as well. It's been completely redesigned. To so take a look at it, it's a lot. It's really sexy. The, 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 my new web designer Simon has really done the biz on it. It's really good. This will be up on it. Yes, it's very, it's very interactive. A, a little <laughs> matrix, you might say, where you can go on your own little adventure. But again, thank you very much, Anthony. Congratulations on your future education, and uh, we shall continue with our Schrodinger's diary. Thanks, Miguel. As always, fantastic to talk to you. Please support AM Byte Gnostic Radio in any way you can. A few shekels here or there. Join my Patreon campaign. 
buy some of me reality disbanding, mind expanding books like Voices of Gnosticism, Heretic, or Stargazer. Subscribe to our Archive of Past Shows. Your continued donations keep this red pill cafeteria open. The various avenues to assist me are found at thegodabovegod.com. Support alternative media away from the few corporations that own all mainstream media. I should mention that I am an Amazon.com affiliate, so any books you order from thegodabovegod.com grant me a kickback. In fact, if you order anything, whether it's clothes, appliances, or sex toys, click through the site and I will get a kickback from that as well. Even if you don't order anything advertised at thegodabovegod.com. Much appreciation to you, Knights of Valis, Shining Crazy Diamonds, and Rainbows in the Dark who support this blast 